Anyway, we went back and changed the prop out. That was my only encounter with that, but there's plenty of turtles too down that way. And they're the dumbest ones in the world. They're like ambient turtles, I used to call them. <laughs> but they have a look at this thing. You'd be 30 knots right next to it, and it's just sort of looking at you. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, like, there can't be a tiger shark or anyone that eats them or anything close <laughs> in the area. They're, they're just happy as. So there's plenty of those to look out for as well. Wow. Turtles and rocks. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin of the story? Too much alcohol. Really? <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's, it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome back, State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. I'm joined with me, my co-host, Anthony Pino, with Hooked Optics and Captain of the Blood Money. Tonight, we have part two with Captain Ross Finlayson on the Seawees. Uh, we spoke to him, I don't know, a handful of months back when he started his, or about to start his Panama trip. And now he five just months. finished. Five months. All right. Wow. So he just got back. He's in Palm Beach, and we're going to hear about... Uh, how it was? How you going, oh. mate? Yeah, it was good down there. What's going on, boys. Um, it's yeah, a man. good spot. I liked it. It was, it was Every, cool. It, you know, everything you dreamed of. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it's hard. I'm always going to be a bit biased, you know. I've come from a pretty good spot, so you kind of think they're going to be everywhere, a bit like Australia all the time. But um, it's, it was different. And everything about it was pretty cool. When we got there in November, it was a wet season, so there was plenty of rain. So you didn't have to wash the boat or chamois at all, which is <laughs> kind of my MO. <laughs> so that was perfect for that. But with all the rain and everything, there's so much debris in the water that it was a pretty scary spot to be just like cruising around and trying to find your feet everywhere because there's no relaxing. You can't see. I don't think I sat out in a helm chair when I was running there for five months, to tell you the truth. There's no sitting back and like wow. enjoying the ride home. Yeah. There's that. And then the local long line boys that put on these surface long line short ones. Oh, yeah. Short, you're just running along. Yeah. You're just running along and then you see two buoys chasing you and like, what happened? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, we had a few swims, you know, getting all nervous about it. And lucky I didn't wrap any of them around they were just caught on a on a blade or a, on a skeg or if you had yeah, the yeah. sonar down they'd catch on the sonar but mostly i could see them coming when i was running home but yeah that was a bit of a you know you're always got your eye out to see a white garbage i mean a black garbage bag flapping in the breeze on a <laughs> stick and you just kind of look in either direction and there's milk bottles and stuff holding the thing up he's pretty agricultural but there's heaps of them you got to look out for it yeah but so- it was good the fishing was good. That was November. And then as the seasons progressed, the fishing was different initially because of that, that whole rain set up and then the current, the way it pours up the coast there from um, from Colombia, Ecuador and all that kind of stuff. So where where'd you base out of Ross? Where you Oh uh, initially I just took my time coming from Costa Rica, looking around, just, you know, just checking out other stuff because we've got a bit of a family deal as well as the fishing. Mm-hmm. So, but in all honesty, it's the cool shit, you know, like good anchorages, pretty spots to look at, you know, some beaches and inshore fishing and that kind of deal. So I just sort of scoped that out initially. And then we were based in Tropic Star for most of that until January, really, about mid-January. So the ship the ship dropped you off and then you ran the Panama City, I assume? Yeah, dropped us off in Golfito and then we went yeah. back to Panama City. Funny how hey, you come through that. Yeah, yeah, you, go you can't, you you can't get back. off till Costa Rica. Like, oh, yeah. what am I doing this for? I don't know why they just can't park up and put you off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you would think that they could just. <laughs> just drop were you, you on off. the Were you on the sinking ship or the the? Nah, the crane the, ship? I was on the la- on the crane one, but yeah. I was the last one on, so they could have swung me off like easy. But <laughs> it's not the protocol. There's a lot of protocol. <laughs> but that so, was what we did. Nice. And now, and then, did um, you? And then you went yeah. to Tropic Star? Yeah, Tropic Star, like everybody does. It's a beautiful spot. It's a great spot to fish. And I'd been there before, so that was good. And I knew some people that were there saying at the time. And Guy Harvey was there at the time, and I'd fished with him there a few years ago. So just having him and then his daughter, Jess, who's really cool as well, and their whole like enthusiasm for the fishing. And it's a pretty good spot to go up every night and have a couple of beers. And at Tropic Star now, they've got the, it's like they've made a bar going out over the water now, not just up at the restaurant. So going up there of an evening, it's it's something to look forward to like it's too easy six miles out you're at the reef 
you can finish six miles, run back in, give her a wash. Generally, the Panamanian washdown was coming anyway, and then you just go in and have a beer and look at the sunset. Yeah, they didn't have to fish till dark. You know, like gentlemen's hours fishing. I'm into that. That's nice. Nice. Yeah. Did, and you were anchored up in the. I assume you have to anchor up in the bay, right? On your. On yeah, a boat that's like right. They got oh, a couple. Of, they got a couple of moorings that they put down there, but. Okay. Oh, I'm not a fan of moorings unless I've gone down for a look at it. I gotcha. I'd rather yeah drop the anchor. So we were dropping the anchor. Nice. Now when you. Would you pull the anchor back in or would you leave your anchor when you went fishing? Nah, pull it back in. You never know when you're going to need it, mate. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Hey, better off looking at it than looking for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, write that one down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, always take that thing with you. Yeah, that's good. So, what, uh, so when you first got over there, what, uh, you know, how. Oh, how initially, long? so, oh, shit. Yeah. See, I'm going to go on forever now if you get me going. And I've only just had one, but if we're I here, another one. <laughs> we're here for you, buddy. You can go on right. as long as you want. So when you first get there, so I'm just giving you the basic lowdown. So every other captain that's watching this, he'll be able to listen in and prickle his ears up and try to get a bit of info. But if <laughs> it's a good going there early in that wet season period, because all of that, I'd never, you know, like you hear of the weed line and all that sort of stuff. And I'm getting used to that over here because you guys have got weeds everywhere. But over there, it's like the trash line. And my trash line, it's actually um, kind of heartbreaking when you first see it because it is like the whole, it's like somewhere 200 miles below you, wherever the current's coming from, they must just be backing up to rivers with semi-trailer loads full of plastic oh, and human wow. waste. And out she go. And all of a sudden, here's this new ecosystem of like shelter and food provider. But it's sadly all the shit that humans put in the water. Mm -hmm. And initially, I was like driving away from it. I couldn't stand looking at it. I'm like, oh, no, just go and follow the edge. Don't worry about these big lines of shit. But, you know, there's trees in them and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine all the gannets and the world and the frigates in the world are going up and down them and the local boys there they're pretty on to it they just go out every day during that wet season and you just run out to you you find a good line and then you just look for a good floater and don't have to stop at any of the reefs to catch bait or any of that you just throw the gear out out there amongst all the rubbish and catch your bait and you can just throw it out and pick around all the rubbish because it's pretty pretty hard to troll that east coast spread around there because all the shit's grabbing on your dredges it's a bit like grass but it's rubbish yeah but it's it, fishing was awesome there was heaps of blue marlin there's dolphin fish there's sailfish but having a look at that that was kind of sad so much stuff going up it's, yeah um, i mean consider, yeah especially how isolated i mean tropic star is kind of in the middle oh, of nowhere it's, it's, it's <laughs> not know? just there it's along the whole coastline yeah 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 but that whole coastline you, you gotta think how far it floats because from tropic Star all the, exactly, all the way down. Mate. It's like there's nothing there. And you know, the odd commercial boat, they're local yeah. fellas. And then once you get outside the boundary, you've got all the, you know, for want of a better word, but there's all the other nations that are, are out there giving it a real red hot go, not to get yeah. political. And you know that they're not keeping any, but plenty of it's coming from land too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And especially in the wet season where it's all just running down the rivers and taking everything that they've been dumping into that, that spot over the dry season and down she goes. All the bait and all the fish are, are in it. You know, like it just wow. made this whole and I got talking to a guy about it he was sort of laughing and you know it's Sky Harvey and not laughing yes it's tragic but look at the it's actually a, a bounty of fish yeah, yeah. you just got to get used to doing it but it's a bit of an eyesore and when you're thinking you're going to somewhere that's just like glamour and, and beautiful yeah, yeah. um fishing around it you know anyway, and that's just that's, during the that's just during the wet season. It seemed to be. So that was the first time I'd, oh, I'd been down there, like I said, but it was on a busman's holiday when I was there for seven days fishing with Laurie Wright and some friends there years ago. But um, from what I gather, yeah, that's wet season standard. Plenty of blue marlin and, and that sort of thing. And there was. Fishing was good, you know. And then you can always still get, you can catch a black on the reef there at any month, but they have their periods that they really like. And I, I put in a bit of time. That was what we were trying to do. It was funny. We caught all these blacks up till January and we hadn't had the boss yet. I was just getting the place, trying to figure it out enough that I could burn out every day and felt like I had a handle on the conditions and what was going on and, and the local boys may have accepted us being there a little bit, you know, instead of yeah. that battle. And um, yeah, we caught plenty. And then when he, he got there, he flew in, fishing was really good. And the coronavirus spread through, but we had one person get the coronavirus, everyone split and went back. And like, that was still in the height when everyone's on the panic program about the virus, including Panama and getting in and out and quarantining and everything. It wasn't worth it. So gave all that way and he had to go. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God that's over. Hey, fella. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's yeah. not over, but yeah, at least getting in and, in and out of some countries is getting a little easier. Oh. Yeah, moving around. How many things you had jabbed up your nose? Oh, oh quite too a few. Many. Too many. <laughs> so Ross, you would you would run out to like in the rainy season, would there like all the trash be on like some big blue green edge or something like that? 
Like Yes and no. Sometimes it'll be on a defined colour change, but a lot of the times it'll be... I used to look at the tank gauge a little, not that it had much difference because it was hot water and hot water and hot yeah, water, yeah. you know. But um, yes, you could see where the brakes were, but obviously you could see it straight away if you're looking over the bow because there's sticks and shit floating everywhere. Yeah. You know, get a run up, pull her out of gear, and if you had a outboard you'd be trimming her up you know yeah, yeah. To, you sort of you stand up a little bit as you're going through <laughs> it all but um yeah it was doing all that and i was trolling so yeah we i didn't i was always really worried about hitting a log because there was huge ones semi-submerged those deadly ones that just like pole yeah yeah yeah, yeah. just a little surface bit but the things like that round and it's some weight to it so you're always really nervous running around and we were trolling one day and i was end of the day like oh we're done it's only like five old go back into Tropic Star and winding the teaser reels up and all that sort of stuff and boom, and the boat stalled and I was like what I see this fairly big stick floating out the back I was like geez that thing stalled me out really oh, I must have just got it perfect start them up again put it into gear stalls again I'm like have a look oh. over the back there and sure enough there's a couple of them lucky I was trolling and we went back in on one and then get in and have a look at it and it's the full three arms one splits a skeg one goes up <laughs> Up inside the tunnel and then the other side on the skeg and the props rotating that way and it's cut through a limb halfway and got it all jammed up in there you can't reverse and knock it out and Medeki here's a bit of a legend in the water and everything he's really good at it everything and um, he jumped over in the morning we had didn't have any stuff and like I had a fair bit of stuff that I thought was gonna get me out of it but if you're going to travel, I reckon those survival saws. Yeah, 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 yeah. With the handles is the ticket. Lucky we got an axe from the lodge and I had a hammer, like a, so just, a short-handled yeah. mallet. And yeah. he went down there with the axe and a tank and we chopped wow. the limb out. And then I was able to reverse and, and get it out. Wow. And we knew I, I'd, I'd folded a blade over. Not too bad, but enough. Just on the tip. One, just one tip one blade and she hardly even vibrated even up 28 knots as i'm running back all the way back to Panama City. i was like wow. i should have stayed there and fished it out anyway we went back and changed the prop out that was my only encounter with that but there's plenty of turtles too down that way and they're the dumbest ones in the world they're like ambient turtles i used to call them <laughs> like, they have a look at this thing you'd be 30 knots right next to it and it's just sort of looking at you like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there can't be a tiger shark or anyone that eats them or anything close <laughs> in the area they're, they're just happy as so there's plenty of those to look out for as well wow turtles and logs oh man so you said you you'd you'd pretty much go out there and look for look for a big floater and then start start your live initially, baiting around there initially they were burning out there doing that and i was just like black marlin and focused to the reef catching bait and putting the bait out and that caught me a few too but they used to just keep burning past and burning past and i'm like what are they on today's fellas and you know poquito espanol just <laughs> <laughs> that's about all i can tell them but i can get them i understand that they're talking some numbers sometimes so they're busting out numbers of their different floaters but i didn't understand any of it every now and then you could see it on the radar and i'll be like ah just leave that to them and yeah you know go out for a look and you find you find the line that they're on and somewhere and we just had to drive down it and find something new you get a bite along it like biggest dolphin fish in the world you just get sick of them damn things they're just charging <laughs> in from everywhere you can't put your gear out Dolph. i'm not what was, the, what was the biggest one you caught I don't know. They're just like 30, 40 pounders. Everyone's like, oh, they're 50 or 60. I don't know about that. But they're just big like ankle busters. Yeah. There's a lot of you them. Know, they're all that big. They were that thick. We were tagging them and letting them go. <laughs> <laughs> they were satellite tagging them when we were there. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and anyway, the... we put some regular tags in them. So, some, guy, some guy in a panga has got a satellite tag in his panga. Yeah. yeah, just run it around on a long line, one of them long liners. Yeah. Anyway, you got to study everything, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was that area. That was good. I, we enjoyed it, but always felt like I wanted to go to the other part where it was a little harder to get to and you weren't looking at because a little, the local, you know, obviously Tropic Star's got a, a pretty good handle on it and all their captains are incredible in their knowledge and growing up there and their first class and the whole operation's first class. They're very friendly to the visiting boats and Richard and Mallory there at the, at the lodge are just so nice. So it's a good deal. It's a good setup. If anyone goes down there, you've got to go there. The history and yeah. just going out there and fishing it, it's well worth doing it. They get those chupacabras, you know what they are? Chupacabra? Chupacabra. I mean, it's the bad dolphin, the, the devil dolphin. What is that? So, so when you get out to the reef, psh, big flipper and he just <laughs> makes beeline for you when you bait fish and eats all your baits. Oh, wow. Tunas. 
piles on the tuners, put one in the water, they eat everything you've got. You just get the head back, no gills. The cheap recoveries. <laughs> so they got plenty of them there. So that's possibly the biggest battle was dealing with that and then yeah. trying to be more cunning than a doll. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. But anyway, it was a few little tricks that we sort of learned along the way, but they're just frustrating another part of the program. But they yeah. deal with it every day and they're pretty good at it. And they've got all their little honey holes, you know, their secret spots. And, and I think they're just inherently incredibly good fishermen, you know, because they were, the boats are uh, much different even from when I went but previous to that. Look, most of the time they would fish with no sounders or gps or anything just off their landmarks larry landmark yeah. goes pretty good when you're only six miles out you know they must have had that down pat and they knew they the conditions there, there. And uh -huh. so they're there and they've all generally the older captains and even the younger ones i still think that they work off that that style of fishing which is so good it's it's good to see it get handed down and handed down and they crush it still you know just reading yeah, yeah. the water and reading the day and here we are with all our fancy bullshit, you know yeah, yeah. We're, st we're still playing catch up with them yeah, yeah, I like it for that. Yeah, wow. yeah. So that was good. We left there in January, back and forth to Panama City a few times with a few bloody boat issues that we all know about. Get all how many, food. how many billfish have you caught by January? Oh, that's a good question, mate. I don't know. I think <laughs> one of the crew kept a record of it. We didn't catch. Oh, I did catch a nice big blue marlin that we satellite tagged, but the tag wasn't possibly in as well as it could. But they reckon they shed quickly. But I'm not sure why they would any different than any other blue marlin. But I just thought it was the the placement, the way you know it was on a lure, it was body wrap, rolled over hook straight and came out on a light tackle style hook, but we still got the tag in it. I think it lasted out there a hundred days or something or 70 or a hundred days, somewhere between that time frame. Nice. I don't know, but I was mainly just counting the black marlin, mate. We caught, I think we got 10 when we were at Tropic Star, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is when you average it out. New Year's Day, we caught three from four. That was our best day. Live baiting for the blacks on the reef, but it, you mm -hmm. can imagine it's tiny. Yeah, yeah. Tiny little spot. So you're trying to play the conditions and if they're there and are they coming later and there's there's obviously there's areas around it that they get to and, and the local fellas have got more of those than anybody and you can just you know if you spent two months there you're just starting to get a couple that you've had a few bites at you're like oh that's my my little consistent spot you know so you're yeah, yeah. trying to throw all that in but you need how, how long do you need it in place to get it really wide like yeah yeah that, that's that's the hardest especially when it's structure orientated and conditions orientated it changes a lot there they get this green water you catch them in some pretty funky water so the black mile and green water there, which it goes against your sort of mindset, you know, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. But if the bait's there and it's all and it's all right, yeah, it's, it's all working and they're around, there's a couple there. It was a really good, but yeah, it's still a tight little area. So you've always had to have a backup plan. That was how I was working it. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're not you just um, trying to bend a rod, but it, the bend, bending the rod's still with a marlin of some sorts. But luckily you've got the blacks there and then you get out to the shelf and there'd be a blue or a sail. There's plenty of that kind of stuff. We were sort of fishing for the marlin. So the sails on the bent up 50, you just sort of, come on, yeah. come in here. We'll take that hook out of you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't circle on any. You need to teach me how to do that. Yeah. Do right. laps around them. Do laps around them. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hook one and get her in the yeah. turn. Yeah. yeah, I'll come up to Cape May one day and we'll, we'll ride Yeah, we'll do a couple of laps around some white yeah. marlin. Yeah, man. I did a bit of it when I went to Bag Bay and... But no, but we were mainly fishing for the blues and the blacks. Mm -hmm. Blue marlin fishing was awesome from yeah. the get-go, the whole time. The moment we got there, the moment we left. There's a couple of quiet periods over the moon, but they're still there. You see them on the screen and everything. Yeah, what, what I mean, what's, is that like consistent, like two or three, four bites a day, or is it better yep. than that? Not just that. And then better yeah. up to a dozen. Wow, yeah. A dozen or more, yeah. plus the ones you're seeing on your teaser that won't commit the ones you're not seeing if you had a tower guy i think you'd cheat yourself you how many you'd see out the back there yeah. yeah it was really it was really really good and i think that whole region with this la nina they're getting has had this even costa rica you talk oh, to yeah, them and they were all, yeah yeah well it was the same in panama it just didn't have to you know there were just there was no one to really work in with but it was more edge fishing i just stuck to the edge and then fish structure in the deep as well sometimes but shit they were in there in 50 fathoms 70 fathoms 100 fathoms Mm -hmm. wherever there wherever it looked good and there was bait you were getting them really nice how many trips did you do back and forth or else or did you stay there the whole time 
Um, no, we just stayed in Panama. We used Panama City as a base, and then as it got later in the year. Yeah, but we I mean, to- like back and forth from Tropic Star. Like, did you did you stay in Tropic Star the whole time, or did you run no. back to Panama City? No, we just go back to Panama City and then make trip. That was mainly because of boat drama. I gotcha. Hitting the log, yeah. Getting that, turning that around. I did that in a day and a half. So that one was pretty good. They've got some good resources in Panama City. You just need to sort of get the right people to help you out. It's yeah. like going anywhere, isn't it? Yeah, that's it's for sure. It's about who you know, and then trying to talk and and meet people and groundwork yeah it's important groundwork's the key uh, how many how many trips did you do back and forth ross to panama uh, city tropic star uh three i think okay gotcha and you would stay like five or six days or longer than yeah that? seven days seven eight nice. days you, gotcha. could get, you could get fuel there but i went on generally off my own most of the time a couple of times i bladded up you know on my run out just so i could be full the whole time and not have to worry about fuel Mm-hmm. How many how, how many miles is it? Well, it's not too bad. It's 120 if you go inside the, the Perlis and then up there. But if you go out to the shelf and fish your day, you can do it in a day. Yeah. It's just that leaving early stuff is pretty sketchy. I didn't like leaving early and running in the dark there, no chance. Yeah. yeah. So And you've still got 50, 60 miles out of Panama City. Panama City is way back up in that bay, long mm-hmm. way in there. That's why I think that place is so good it's still a little tricky you still got to be resourceful Mm -hmm. not just back to the marina every night kind of deal yeah there there isn't anywhere really how much is fuel down there it was um where we were it was like 98 cents a liter oh wow um for a while but then it went up with all the other well the same as everywhere went up to about i think when last i was there it was a dollar 15. wow Um, not bad no not at all how uh how's the trip like i've I've heard some people have some pretty I mean, it's not a long trip but the weather can be kind of bad going between there and tropic star right you have Panama. heard haven't you yeah Guatemala. yeah Guatemala, the bad point yeah right i only got it it was just shitty 25 yeah. to 30 you know but there's heaps of current so the 25 to 30 is ugly short you know up one down one through one kind of deal <laughs> <laughs> and it changed all the time. It's it's a really wild spot with their currents there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it can be really ordinary. If you if you're going the other way, you sort of you know you're in for a flogging no matter what. And then once it gets into shit, they only get a few months when it's not that rough at that place, Punta Mala. Yeah. And initially it wasn't, and I was like, Oh, what's the problem here? But you could see a couple of the days when there's nothing, hardly any wind, a couple of storms around, and the riffle would turn into something enough for you to think, Oh yeah, I can Punta Mala, I get it. Gotcha. And then yeah. as the dry season starts and that big offshore funnels down from the Caribbean right across or through the canal and out through that whole bay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's ugly. And it's 90 mile once you get to that corner in. Yeah. And 50 huh. of it, it's shit. <laughs> Which is a long haul. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, so it's the last bit of your, yeah, your, your journey. Yeah, Punta Mala's going up to the north, right? When you're running up to... Guatemala is like on this southern corner, so to speak, and you go yeah, north yeah. up into the bay to get into Panama City. Okay, gotcha. And there might be a couple of little angles you could run if you got there. You know, like it'll extend the distance you got to go. But I, yeah, I yeah. reckon if you're, I ran inshore a little bit and followed some, you could still muck around with it. Yeah. How? Uh, so you fish, you fish Tropic Star till from December. You got there, right? No, and, November to November. January. I got you. All right. We did do a trip up out the other way. Um, just to go and get my bearings on the inshore anchorages that I wanted to get to. Mm-hmm. I actually went to all the places that I wanted to go and anchor and, and sussed them out before I had anybody on board, just so I knew where I was going. And, and we had to get into a, a river, a little um, intimidating if you didn't have help, mm-hmm. trying to read the river because it was sort of read in a couple of places a little opposite to what you would think it would. Oh, but I had a, a guy come and help me to get in there, and that was really beneficial. And then after that, it was sweet. But I did do a fair bit of groundwork. I actually went to Panama City and then drove by car back to, to a lot of the different places is to check out what it was like from land and just see what the story was because you still you can get in there and sometimes get fuel and you still got to get all your groceries you still got to get your people there yeah and this is going up to the north right yeah yeah north gotcha. I, I say i say north but it's kind but of it's west, west. I, yeah yeah. yeah it gets me all screwed up too don't worry uh-huh. but yeah yeah up, that, up that, towards Montu- montuosa the, the areas you would fish at montuosa Hannibal and montosa yeah yeah, yeah. Gotcha. and coeba and that whole region yeah yeah, gotcha. yeah. it's beautiful gotta go yeah. don't get it too pop well i don't think it'd get too popular because 
you got to put a bit into it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it suits everybody either. But if you wanted to get away from it, see some beautiful country. And some of the bays, there's this beautiful spot called Bahia Honda that um, Peter Neal, a guy that everybody needs to get in touch with if they go down there. They get in touch with Peter Neal, he'll hook them up. Anyway, Pete had told me about it. He says, you got to go into Bahia Honda. It's gorgeous, you know. And it's like a hurricane hole anchorage. And it is really. It's this harbour that's got all these different bays that are quite protected and deep that you can get into. And you could just about get into it anyone no, no matter what the wind conditions but flat calm everybody has a good sleep because there's a lot of tide in panama and a lot of surge and it, every anchorage it might be nice you know for a little while while you're anchoring until about 10 o'clock and then there'll be a tide change or something happens at two in the morning and roll your guts out and then you got to turn on the the sea keeper and it's as noisy as i don't know what anyone says about those things like yes it stops you from rolling but jesus <laughs> for a light boat sleeper, listen to that thing whine and carry on all night. Yeah. I got used to it, but oh. But it does make a difference. At least you're not rolling the crap off everything. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I, what I actually saved my sea keepers for down there, just anchoring. You don't need them. The weather was beautiful. Yeah. What, Ross, let me ask, like, I haven't anchored a sport fish in, like, forever. And But what's your process when you go into one of these bays and stuff like that? Like, how you, oh. do, do you have a, I, I assume you have, like, a pulpit and everything like that up there. I do. This one we call a whale dick, or that Marvin yeah, Scarborough yeah. calls it a whale's dick. So I got the whale's dick over the front, but um, I went with a bit more chain. Like normally in Australia, we go with all chain mm -hmm. and a really good anchor. But I did a lot of research for myself with this boat and its weight and everything. So I've got a fairly heavy anchor, an ultra anchor, in fact, that and a hundred feet of chain and then rope. And then I'm trying to look because it's got a fair bit of water movement there 15 to 20 feet so you always got to be aware of that and everything you're swinging of a night even if the prevailing wind's been pretty consistent you think it's, you're going to get it you'll be a 360 at some point during the night so i get in there try to get in there a bit early and no matter if anyone says if you've got a towel but oh you don't use it too much but few times you want to use it when you're anchoring in it and it helps you position it's worth its weight in gold it's paid for itself then so i often always go into a spot always in the tower uh -huh. checking it out seeing what's going on with the wind and then lay my anchor right like that there's a lot that goes into laying the anchor and uh, as far as the skipper's concerned and a crew combination that you get into that it's a bit like setting a circle hook yeah and once you get good at it and you get it right It'll save dragon anchors and a lot of other shit that you, you'll see with people that run into trouble. And a lot of guys, I've, we don't see them in Aussie too much. Maybe it's the back anchor, but those fortress lightweight ones are all well and good. But um, there's a lot of things. If you don't set those things right, the chain gets around those flukes. Those oh, so what, you didn't have a fortress. You had a, a, like a plow? Oh, I did. It was an ultra anchor. So it's similar to a plow and a Bruce. It's got its own attributes. You can, it's a whole subject getting into anchoring. Like, <laughs> Well, you could do a whole episode on that, but um, you kind of got to see, and it's generally whatever you've had experience with, and we do a lot of anchoring, so I've used a lot of different type. And then I did decide on this one just through things that I'd heard from friends that had had one. And then um, old mate sold it to me pretty well with his demo at the Miami Boat Show <laughs> <laughs> on the ultra anchor. And I thought, oh, that's good. And, and then when you do your research, you'll find that heaps of chain or a lot of chain is very beneficial, but it's not always instrumental in the best anchoring, but a heavy anchor to the right combination of chain length and then road is, what'll hold you in there. So I was always really confident with my setup that I was never dragging. It just had to do with swinging room. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what it's nearly all about. Because you, you know, if you scope it out too much in one direction and then she swings during the night and then you could be in strife over there against the shoreline where the rocks yeah. are exposed that were 20 foot under the water when you got in there, you know? Yeah, yeah. So there's oh. a lot of that. You, you never sleep really well on anchor. Just no, like, I was wondering. Oh, I was wondering about that. But nah, that sounds awful. Nah. <laughs> nah. It's just one of those things. But you get yeah. better in time. But that um, Bahia Honda mm -hmm. was the spot to go for a good night's sleep. Bloody nice. beautiful. Flat calm all night. Everyone wakes up happy as Larry. And then the, the local guys in their pangas live really simply. You can't get there by car. They get in by horseback or by boat. And it's a whole village. Cool as hell. And the people are generations 
of them that have been living there and they'd paddle out. It was mainly trade that they liked. It's not like you had to buy anything. They'd trade you fruit for some batteries and fish hooks and, you know, batteries for a little bloody torch, you know, or yeah. we got really friendly with quite a couple of them and that, you know, bring you out all the bait you want if you want to go inshore rooster fishing or cuberas or whatever. You know, it's a dollar a bait. It's nothing. 20 bait, you know, and it means a lot to those people and they'd trade different things here and there and beautiful carvings they'd get into, you know, that they'd want to barter a bit with you, but nice people and that was what we really liked about it was the whole um interaction of mm-hmm. everything it wasn't just sufficient fishing was awesome but it was really pretty country and the people were so nice and it was a bit of a step back in time yeah it sounds like it yeah, pretty, yeah it's good and it, it's a fish life unbelievable so wherever you would go didn't matter you turn your lights on at light night and the smaller stuff there'd be gazillions of it to big snook mangrove snappers you name it Corvinas. Wow. Yeah, right there in Panama City was the best Corvina fishing that we saw. Huge <laughs> ones, you know, like yeah. 15 pounders, and they eat really well. They're pretty good on the fang. I like uh-huh. those. They were good. But yeah, it's just so much fish life everywhere. Yeah, you did some wow. like, I saw you did some like deep dropping and stuff too, right? Oh, uh, one day. That was just. Oh, one like, day? Yeah, that was a half ass. <laughs> yeah but we did we caught a couple of groupers thought we were deadly we had it sorted and then we spent another hour not catching jack shit and i was like <laughs> oh, we got enough are we done for this because <laughs> that's a whole other program oh yeah but uh, some people get into it i like it but yeah you know <laughs> it's the old like can we can we watch whales today catch a marlin catch a bottom fish and then see the best sunset ever yeah no worries and if you're gonna do it that place you could do it but uh yeah, it's just another one of those things. But yeah, not too much deep dropping. But I think there is some some reasonable deep dropping there. And a guy who had a Paradise Lodge, actually, his name's Jorge, good fella. He um he did a lot of it and caught some beautiful big groupers and all sorts of stuff. There's all that Kibera fishing and you like you'd be at Hannibal Bank as the season got later, just when we were leaving, actually Hannibal and Montosa, and it happens at Troptar too. You'd be there marlin fishing around, and then it, you just see this boiling patch of fish on the water that looks all red, and you get over there and it's all mullet snappers breeding. So we saw all these mullet snapper burning around, and they're like 15 to 20 pounds. Yeah, yeah. All burned around like that. Those that redfish footage I see in the outer banks mm-hmm. burned around like that, and then you see them drop um, all the milk. The water just goes milky, like you poured in a ton of milk into the water. It must be all the milk on the eggs, and then they're gone, you know. But there's this big white patch in the water that stays there for ages, and we saw that a few times. It was incredibly cool to see wow shit loads of frigate birds like the bird life and um and the tuna the local tuna fishermen and and their unique ways of going about their their fishing for them was pretty cool to watch too so they were a constant mainly in the hannibal area but i'm sure they're out there off tropic star too but Did you um, see any of those uh beer fishing boats there while you're yeah, there yeah 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 saw them there i don't i didn't know that they were getting amongst them when we were there but i think now the tuna's really yeah. started yeah this is the time now yeah so, and it started raining again like the dry season's real short so it started raining again and and all the rest of it but yeah they'd be, they were getting into it i think the last the last day i did there i went five from ten and that was just like at a small estimate to make myself feel better <laughs> i don't know how many blue marlin i saw on that day but the bait <laughs> wow. the bait in the water that was everywhere and the dolphin life and the bird life and what the tuners must be like there was incredible because you would sometimes you go over and you'd see where the dolphins have worked up a little small bait ball but it's like this red red looking i couldn't really tell what he was but he must be like a blue runner you know style thing but a little bit narrower in, in shape but pretty decent yeah style. they're like uh we call them i mean they're like red like fish a speedo or, or like a cigar minnow like that yeah. so but i don't know if that was all the bait that i was seeing on my sounder but it was just everywhere you drove like there was a lot of stuff yeah wow Pretty what, incredible spot you and said i that... didn't even touch the surface didn't even fish with the tuners hardly like you think you're gonna go out there and look for birds and gonna get in front of the dolphins and drop a live bait over the side catch a 200 pound tuna well you can but boom there he is on the teaser oh I'll do another lap and then <laughs> shoot it's 3 30 already we didn't even you know the day goes pretty quick when they're piling on you <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really get a chance to like, all right, you know, let's just go and do this and, and see what happens. When you were trolling, you were trolling then kind of lure fishing? Yeah, or, I, I, or I was bait? either live baiting or trolling lures and teasers. I got you. Nice. Yep. And then you, what, what did you do? Did you find to be more productive or was there oh, a the certain, black marlin certain thing? I did have a bite on it. I should have done a bit more dead baiting. And in hindsight, I would do it just 
Aussie style. Because the times that I did do it, I got bit anyway. And the blues bite you doing the same shit. You mean like um, the three beats like you would do in the in the yeah, Great Reef? I got or you. two. Yeah, you could do two, two and yeah. still run your T's and stuff. And I think the blues would come up. But a lot of the banks and the high spots are quite... Um, small and, and even trailing lures around them you know you, you start getting seasick because you're rocking yourself out of the boat with your own wake you know it's that tight <laughs> yeah so the live baiting was good for it because you felt like it was a slow good methodical way to fish for it so i'd either do that for the black and the blues the blues would get in there too if you just made a pass a bit wider but when i say wide like 50 fathoms and 30 to 50 is not much on the highest pinnacles you know they're right in there with it um i'd do that and if that was slow and i wanted to go for a look around i'd just get yeah, four lures two bridge teasers and the dredges yeah deadly nice blue marlin love that stuff as did the sailfish everything yeah we caught blacks doing the same deal nice. just the same as i do in australia but now i've got this fancy boat with all these fancy dredge reels and, <laughs> uh, electric, i got dials and stuff to turn it <laughs> what 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 you said towards the end of your stay was good was yeah the last day we did we went five for ten wow what, what month was that? Um, that was the end of March. Okay, gotcha. End of March. Gotcha. End of March, beginning of April was when we left. And yeah. That was that. And, and it, it looked like it was all set to go because for us, and it doesn't always happen this way, it seems to be like, and I'm sure you guys would agree too, that sometimes moon phases, I, I, I really strongly believe in, but both of them can be really good. And sometimes one's better than the other, but you never know which one that's going to be until you're fishing it and you can <laughs> yeah. work out the pattern for it. Yeah. And it'd been similar for us the whole time we were in Panama with a, a certain particular time in the moon that things would start happening again. And, um, We'd had a trip on when it was tougher and I was seeing them on the sounder and, and getting them coming up and then going away, half ass bites and teasers, all this kind of stuff. We picked away at them, but it certainly wasn't as good as a previous trip we did on a different moon, you know, like, but still not good. So like you get three or four bites for the day, but you're seeing a lot. Where yeah. was the five, for, where was the five for 10 at? That was at, uh, Hannibal. Hannibal. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. And it's a big spot too. Yeah. Yeah. It, like keep yourself busy there in a the day. Like you can just keep going back, but, Everywhere that I went, anywhere on a chart that looked like it had good bottom and, it, and none of the charts and the topography on it is very close to what the charting is, but it's an indication that there must be some good shit around there. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking for it, you will find it. And anywhere that looked good, and especially when there's a bit of current and you knew which way that was running, anywhere that I went that I thought looked like it should have something did. That's yeah, wow. what I liked about it. Like, because not all every day was about like a hardcore day at the Hannibal Bank. Like, all right, we're going to this anchorage tonight. Well, uh, shit, I've got this far to go. I've got to I can only fish this particular location till then, and then we'll just, you know, troll down the line. Mm -hmm. But there was a good spot in this little area. I might, you know, do a couple of laps around, and especially if I can get there by this particular time. And geez, you could you could do that everywhere, and you find them. It was real. That's what I liked about it. Like, I felt yeah. like if the water was nice. I was going to get a bite. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Because there's plenty of days we do when it's not like that. So. Oh, yeah. I just had one. <laughs> and, it was, <laughs> and it was really calm. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't get sick of that. Yeah, I'll did go you, back in a heartbeat. Did you feel like you got into some bigger fish there? Ross? Nah. Got that one nice blue marlin. The blacks is where that's at. And I think if you were there oh. all the time. Uh, but apparently they reckon from now through to September is pretty good for it, but you get wet, but a lot less people. But yeah, there's potential for some beauty black marlin there and some big blues. Like we did get that nice blue marlin. And I think someone weighed a big blue marlin in Costa Rica that they got tar wrapped the other day that went like 7.30 or something. Did you wow. guys see that? No, no did not. Yeah, I heard that. Um, oh. But nah, they're wigglers, hundreds of, you know, every now and then someone would look up and you go, how big's that cut the 300? And you go, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sure, whatever you want it to be, mate. But yeah, they're just that, yeah. you know, they're just that good size, good performance. Like, and yeah. like I say, we were just using the bent butt fifties because they had a lot of older people and lots of people that had never done it before. Mm -hmm. Chair's the best spot for that. Yeah. Put them central, show them some technique and you know stand up can be terrible on people with no idea mm -hmm. or that haven't done it before so we just mainly did that and stuck with our four bent butt 50s and about a couple of bent butt 80s or 70 pound pens with 80 pound on it for my live baiting yeah you just it was good you don't have a lot of gear you got those rods and your bait gear and then your your fun stuff your pop efficient for inshore with the cuberas that was kind of our program we catch bait in the morning maybe throw some stick baits around, some pressure points, 
in the washes and that kind of deal and, and then go marlin pretty nice. easy there was there's a lot of sailfish there too if everyone that loves all that you know dink baiting and whatever but we were just trying to catch marlin yeah so like when you would go lure fishing you would see a handful of sails or more a day or yeah oh yeah sometimes more than that we would get doubles <laughs> and triples of them things <laughs> I like how you get them on, you get them on my worries. All that <laughs> finesse shit you guys are into, it's funny. <laughs> but you, I'm sure you catch way more than us. I don't know how many we wound at the boat, and I'm looking, I'm like, there's another one there. You know, we'd toss a little bait back that we'd have as a pitch bait, and we didn't get one of them. But there was, I think if you went lappy, lappy around them all, yeah, you'd go dizzy. <laughs> we were, I was just getting them and then trolling around them. And a lot of the times, like you guys would know too, from that neck of the woods, is you get a sailfish and there's a blue marlin somewhere in there. Yeah. Wow. They, they seem to hang a little bit together sometimes. Had, I've had many of those. There are not many, but plenty of times in Costa Rica where you're like you hook a blue and like a lot of the times, like we jump it off. And then next thing you know, there'd be like four sails behind the boat as soon as every we, time, yeah, mate, yeah. same story. <laughs> you, you hook a blue, you do one lap around if you catch him, and there's sailfish piling on stuff on your teasers. And yeah, same story. Wow. There was plenty of it. We just sort of, you know, if we snagged them, we talked about sailfish like they're kudas. They're a you know, <laughs> pest to them. You couldn't care less Not about them. <laughs> Everyone gets all sensitive about it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> They're good, but we were trying for marlin. But it was all good fun. I didn't give a shit as long as it's action and you're seeing something. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, like, there were so many sails that came on our teasers that either didn't eat the pitch bait or we didn't hook it on the on the long way or it went away. But there was plenty of visual up under the rig at the hanging. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Can't get tired of that. No, nah, no, nah, whatever it is. I was happy to see a dorsal. Like, yeah. hey, <laughs> nice. Yeah, wow. So when you, how long was the trip up to Hannibal, Hannibal Bank for us? Like when you left Panama City and then, or went, went up that direction, not, not necessarily Hannibal Bank, but up that direction. What was, what would a typical hundred, trip be like? That's a couple hundred mile around, the, around to there, but it depends because everywhere you go is all based on where you're staying that night. Mm -hmm. There's that, a little but, lodge uh, there in Cohiba, I believe, right? There's no lodge on Coeba. Um, Zancudo's inshore on the mainland. Is it Zancudo? That's, no, that's Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah. And then there's Paradise Lodges um, in that region, which is where I got a lot of my information from, Jorge, and we stayed at his place up that river there. I would park up there and get fuel and get supplies. But you had to drive into David, the town of David, to do that. Um, there's another place called Boca Chica and then there's Parita, these islands. You, you just get on a chart and have a look, but it just, it takes, you know, there's a bit of planning that goes into it. Mm -hmm. So you, you would, would you have to chug up, up from Panama City to, to do that? Cause it's to conserve fuel or? Were you, at times, was... at times, but once I worked out that I could get fuel. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't do as much chugging, but I still did, you know, obviously to save fuel and we weren't trying to meet a deadline. They got you, yeah. But yeah, once we found out I could get pretty good fuel, I didn't have any problems with it. Couple, you know, just got to change your filters regularly, and they don't look like they're that flash when you're pulling them out. But I, I went down with a lot, and I was going to use a lot. Yeah. Did you have to deal with the? Do you um, drain water out of your rake cores regularly, or uh, just no. change the filters? A couple of times there was a little bit in the bowl you could see, but mainly the, you know, the black death is always the one. But I never saw it in sludge form. Just I black filters, but you know, it's always the way. You're in the tropics, eh? Hey? I don't know where you can get away from that. You get fuel in Golfito, it's going to be the same story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Unless they've got those above ground tanks that they're changing regularly. Anywhere you go that's got one in the ground, you're kind of like, oh, okay. yeah, gotcha. Yeah. I was always really nervous about it, but I touch wood, I never had a problem when I was down there. I know that there was a couple other guys that did get some gutfuls of dirty stuff at different times at different places but no it was overall it was pretty good but yeah you got to think about a lot from panama city that's just the hardest part of it mm -hmm. is getting back to panama city for um anything that you needed that was major would, would those trips be longer than than say your tropic star trips would you stay out there longer so yeah, you had longer yeah to but go? we had a mothership too we were wow. using a mothership that we would that the boss would get every time he flew in so not that i got supplies off then there was always a chance and i did do on the end of a couple of trips but i was making myself i was doing seven to eight days on my own bottom okay gotcha most of the time and then if i was getting fuel off him i'd get 200 or 400 gallons just to make sure it was good but 
you know, that was more just like they want to be that guy kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then you're also worried about, you know, you get you've been there for five months getting fuel and and you're never quite sure on how good it is everywhere. But the one thing with Panama City, I can assure you, is they burn probably more diesel there than anywhere. When you start looking at all the ships waiting in that bay to get fueled up, yeah. I don't know about the kind of fuel they're getting on. I'm sure it's not as good as the stuff we're looking for, but there's plenty of diesel fuel there, but you just got to get back there. Yeah, gotcha. Interesting. Damn. Yeah, it's good. I like all that kind of deal. Yeah. You said you had then- a ladder to it sometimes? What's that, mate? You said you had a bladder at some points too? I did, but then I never knew, really sort of, if you were going to go out and say run out to some fads in different areas, either Costa Rica and they've got some out off Panama, which I never did just because of that, that whole weather thing and the, and the, um, the floaters, mate, because there's yeah. no leaving early. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it, it's a bit more of a, it's a pretty good spot for a slow boat fishery because you, yeah. It's no good burning around at 40 knots and, and yeah. leaving early. You still got to wait till the sun comes up, and you know 40 might help you then. But what's a what's a typical day like out there when you're anchored up or on the mothership? You know, um, and then we were doing like, some days where we'd you know we're getting up at 5 5 30, cup of coffee. What do they call it? A seagull's breakfast. Getting up, doing that. You know, what is it? A drink, a piss, and a look around. Yeah, we'd go out have some breakfast basically on the way, get out and catch bait, then be fishing by 6.30 and then knocking off at 3 o'clock, 3.30. Yeah. Coming back in and do the cleanup. And initially it was really good because of the rain, like I say. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Just at the end of the day, you're kind of like, oh, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so how, like, where you're anchored up, like, how far would you have to, would you... I mean, how far would you run or uh, just kind of jog, right? Tropic was the closest. Yeah. Six, seven miles. And then seven, up. Actually. Yeah. And then up. And then the other way closest is 14. Okay. Gotcha. And then you're up to oh, 14, 25 would have been the next. There's a couple other spots you can go to, but they're rolly. I wouldn't call them really anchorages. Mm-hmm. Hickorita was real close. That one was a good spot. We loved it there. From the fishing, from 100 fathoms to where you're anchored is half a mile. Wow. So that one was really handy and it's pretty, pretty beautiful spot. Loved it there. Um, but it can get a bit rolly too. Yeah, I'm sure. Being but it's close. just like paradise, the little island that you're against. And yeah, it's just gorgeous. And then um, back into the mainland is mainly, there's some other islands that you can go to, but you're still looking at 30 mile run. Gotcha. So you have so, to yeah. you you have to be aware when it comes to the fuel and everything like that. Hundred percent. So yeah. say on a seven day trip, you're doing a couple of short anchorage nights. Uh-huh. To save some running, you know, some fuel, roll your guts out, do a 40 mile run in for everybody to get some sleep. And if you've got enough, you might do that again. And then you might do another like midway anchorage and then go back. Wow. Gotcha. But that's how you roll. It's a lot like Aussie, the same story, you know, with anch- it's all about the anchorage. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you can only handle that rolliness for so long, especially yeah. when you're out there for a long time. I can either, you know, maybe I think an age gap, at <laughs> 25 you could do it i see guys out there burning around on center consoles and camping in them and i was like oh yeah i get it but <laughs> was there a lot of other boats out there with you like oh uh, yeah there's quite a lot of panamanian guys there generally in center consoles yeah yeah and, and a lot of them looking for tuners gotcha chuck and poppers yeah a little bit of light baiting for black marlin because it's an outboard boat you know like it goes better when they you know doing that ultra slow i haven't seen an outboard boat that really loves lure trail and at eight knots or nine knots and yeah they're not even though they were doing it and they were catching the blues too but they were mainly tuna fishing and then there's a few other traveling boats would come past and fish mm-hmm. um the sneak attack boys they like a black mile and they were there i saw them a few times who else did i see there was a few other guys lucid interval there for a bit another one that i met along the way but yeah not many and then the yeah. center console fellas out of those sport fishing lodges mm-hmm. and the spearos. And then you could, yeah, yeah. there's a couple, there's a lodge that you could run, run up to and tie up to for a night or something or. Yeah. Yeah. You gotcha. can do that. You can, there's a couple of locations you can get into, um, but you want to do your homework before you get there. Mm-hmm. Just every, and every boat's different. Every person's different with their setups, but yeah, just do your homework and try to, work out where you want to go and what you want to do. If I was yeah. going to give any suggestions to anyone going there. Wow. Gotcha. And go there well in advance. 
like everywhere. I think that's just a given everywhere. Like, yeah, like you, you it, went, you, you personally, like you said earlier in the in the in the pod, you said you actually like flew in the Panama City and then drove up there to scope it all out, huh? Well, we went by boat. We looked at some anchorages. Mm-hmm. I went by car, worked out my logistics for stores, getting people in, transfers, fuel. Yeah, yeah. Checked out the locations by land, met the people, sat down, had a beer and a yarn, and stayed a night, went on to the next. It's all very well to get them on the phone or a text through somebody that's given it to you, but nothing beats the face-to-face. And yeah. as far as I could, you know, that works for me anyway. I prefer it like that, to go yeah. and meet the person. And is that, don't know. Is you don't that know so- for a bar of soap, you know. So you just, yeah. how you going? Can you help me out? Is that sort of that sort of approach was uh, your approach or was the 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 the, the owner having a no, that's like my suggest approach. that he, I got gotcha. you. That's my approach to it, but he was good because he's just he's smart owner. Yeah, yeah. You, you send yeah. your boat and your crew there and have them go fishing, mm-hmm. which we did yeah. with yeah. friends as well. But a lot of the times it was just myself and my crew. We would fish. Yeah. We would get the anchorages because you know, like they're coming in with their friends and their people. You want it all to go smoothly, yeah. Yeah, I want everything like i want to know the bloke that's paddling up to my boat in his dugout canoe and Mm -hmm. you know and know the kind of goods he's got that he wants to show and maybe sell and then everything about it i I just want it to make to go really smoothly it's all really good too if they're there with you for the exploratory trip but not all the owners can do that yeah yeah anywhere you go i think everybody should be like that it's a little bit like um this is a whole other subject that nick and i brushed on another time but i was going to say like there there should be more owners because you guys have got more game boats that travel in your neck of the woods so this is just my opinion of what i've seen so far since i've been doing this and coming to america but you guys are pretty well centrally located eh? you can go and do all this deadly stuff in the atlantic which is really only five to six hours flight like Azores and Cape Verde. I know there's a little bit more to get to Cape Verde, but you can do all that. You've got all this Atlantic side covered. Then you just go down to Costa Rica and you've got Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Panama, all there on your doorstep. And soon enough, Peru, like Cabo Blanco, there's got that fancy marina. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but there's some potential there for going somewhere where there's some giant fish and some different kind of styles of fishing all yeah. within easy reach of you yeah so it's Is that um, Peru? yeah yeah you're ideally situated to be able to take advantage oh, of yeah. it all but if people did that and they got like a um cayman island flag or a jamaican flag yeah and the crew problems as far as finding crew to enough crew to go around all the bloody game boats you've got going on over here and everyone you know wants to be home and doing all their things like it's tough to get crew uh, and I've been hearing that from everybody, but it, if they had a flag of the Cayman Islands and so forth, they could open up their options to all sorts of crew that would love to do that kind of thing from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the list goes on. Why can't, some, why couldn't an American boat do that? Like, I mean, like you, you, you can't have a crew on an American boat from another country unless they've got the correct visa and that visa is uh, done by. Gotcha, I was lucky yeah. enough to get it, but yeah, yeah, I think um, for that style, once you start branching out and going to different places, yeah having that would gotcha. solve some of the problems or help ease some of that problem because there's so many really good crews getting around that just can't get the opportunity but you guys live on the golden egg you don't realize it for all these game boats that travel and all the people that have got the funds to be able to do it and spread it around i yeah. just love to see some of the aussie mates getting on board you know i got you yeah <laughs> but uh yeah I, don't, I lost track of what i was talking about then but yeah, that air, that whole reach really good. You're pretty lucky being in the United States, that's for sure. Yeah, that's pretty cool that you know that your your owner was kind of like, yeah, go scope it out so it all you you know the area and it all goes smoothly. You know what I mean? Like I think that's that's super right. important. We learned we're learning the hard way here in Cap Cana. We were able to do that in Casa de Campo, but here we just started fishing because all the locals made it seem so seem so easy and is it is not you know yeah so, right so yeah i, I, can I think it, it, you know and i'm sure any other fisherman agree with me like every captain and crew worth his salts would go shit yeah but i'm just lucky that my guy is you know they're paying us anyway it's a bit of fuel and food yeah and especially when you go to those kinds of places when you're not burning in and out you're not you're sort of yeah, yeah. using that much and it was like it's my style you know it's like the aussie style which is the liverboard, go and creep around and anchor up and do what we do. And it, it works really well. 
I yeah. think it's the way to go. And it made me feel a lot better. Just made, you know, as a captain and a crew, you feel like you're onto it. You know what's going on there. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's the way nice. to go. It's not, it's not good feeling lost. I know that No, feeling. when you get there and you kind no, of like, shit, I don't know where I'm going today. Which way is the prevailing current? You're asking yeah. everybody for everything. and Anthony's got to shake it off, man. He's got a oh. bad attitude right oh. <laughs> it's, it's been tough, man. Just you, Vodka and cider will shake it off. You know, yeah, you're just like, well, you're just like, oh, man, do I do kind of what my instinct feels like or do I go do what the locals are doing and try to scratch out the day? You know what I mean? Like it's – and I, I, I don't know what to do. Your uh, so, yeah, so we'll be doing follow that Follow your instinct, mate. Because, like, it's the same fish everywhere. Yeah, there might yeah. be some different things. You know, oh, he's getting in his head. He's, he's, he's his own worst enemy right now. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, which other captain in the world is not his own worst yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Tell me about it. Do you got? Did you guys uh like talk at all? For you still have plans for like South Pacific and all that? Yeah, yeah. So um, go back and see old my old mate Ricky Scarborough. Can't wait to see him. Actually, he's a good bloke. Come um, go and see Ricky and Sarah and take the boat back and do some work, just like they all need. You know, five months out at sea, learn a lot of different things that I would do differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a whole other subject. Um, go back do some work on the boat, fish out Oregon Inlet for a month, which is probably as scary as anything. <laughs> If anyone's tried to deal with, uh, like, it's just getting to the bridge, which is my biggest that? nightmare. Yeah, Oregon Inlet for a month and then Cape May again for the summer. Yeah. <laughs> I expect you to keep me in on the scene now, mate. Like, I Gotta, get, text, gotta like give, me my, give my phone number, man. Uh, yes, for sure. I'll be texting you for the down low. Yeah. Fish out of there. And then our plan at this point, all subject to change, like everything to do with the boat, is still south pacific tahiti wow and that's then insane. i decided on oh i didn't decide on it we we both decided on it but um depending on what comes after it like it's all very well to go to tahiti but where are you going after there because if you're going to go to the west you you know it, it, there's a lot of strategy involved because the distances between yeah yeah being able to get the go go just just extend hugely and yeah. So I, I'm just trying to work out how we want to go about that. So I might even, if it's possible, I'll ship to there, fish there, maybe six months. This wow. is in an ideal world. I don't even know what the schedule is, but this is my in my head at the moment. Fish there and then to Australia. And then if we fish, if we're able to fish the reef, then I would possibly try to then fish in that um, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands area. I'm sort of keen to get to the Solomon Islands. Yeah. soon because i just saw on the news that their bloody prime minister signed a fishing deal with china oh no yeah and new guinea's done the same thing so their whole fleet's just like on the aussie border just starting to creep in everywhere now they're the scourge of the north pacific yeah it is it's going to be so i feel like all right go and do this not that i don't know if that had that much of an impact commercial fishing on big giant marlin populations because you know like on an average long line of how many of the giant ones are eating you know whatever they're putting on there yes they're eating the, the tunas that they hook up but i don't know how much they have an effect on it yeah but it has an effect they've on still got to else. get to the giant stage don't they yeah yeah so that was yeah. a bit scary when i heard that the other day so I, that it's south pacific but i'm not sure on the exact schedule gotcha but trying to satellite tag fish as we go and still on the black marlin like i went down there we satellite tagged the blue i was going to satellite tag black marlin and caught him all before the boss got there and we caught bugger all when he was <laughs> 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 little blue marlin that i was like are we gonna waste one on that not wasted it. it's still good information yeah, yeah. but um, it kind of wasn't what we were trying yeah. to hope for yeah pretty amazing you gotta go mate you better get in there where to panama no, it, but oh. your dinner's on the table. Oh, it'll be all right. We'll have to do bi-weekly uh, podcasts when you're over there, man. I got to – Yeah. That's going to be epic. <laughs> we can do that like on the catch-ups of it or we're not quite bad company status. <laughs> but yeah. We've still got the same mindset. I nice. like it, man. It's going to be sick. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it is. I really, I'm looking forward to putting out the big rods again and and um and going heavy, Chuck. Maybe we'll catch one of those elusive giant granders that you get up there in Cape May area this year. Just gotta keep the super plunger out on the short rigger. Never know, dude. It's a <laughs> it's a strange place. That place can be out there in the deep. Stumble upon one, just come out of Everybody nowhere. Everybody you know? tells me there's giant ones there, so I like it. I, still... I mean, you're Ross. You're a you're a 
definition of giant is completely different than our East Coast, you know, giant. Like you experience true giants. We yeah. like we we see. I mean, there was a twelve hundred pounder killed there last year, so they're there. But your consistency of big fish is where you come from is far none. I understand, oh. but I still think you you know just the, the fact that you can get a seven. You know, I don't. It doesn't need to be a giant giant. Yeah. After everything I saw in Costa Rica, Panama, I'm I'm ready for a six to seven hundred pound giant yeah you come at me anything like that look yeah just looking forward to putting the big rods out that's for sure nice yeah nice man what about you nick what are you doing Um, i haven't seen too much on the temptress no i'm on i got a on a 58 weaver right now uh we're trying to wrap it up here in the yard and probably head down to uh southern bahamas and then uh maybe bvi then dr they're getting them over there too i heard yeah in yeah. the Bahamas. Yeah, that pes- Pescaria, man, they, I think, two slams or three slams, like, consecutive or something. Yeah, that's something good, like that. eh? Yeah, it's yeah. incredible. And then we've got, like, um, more heads already biting, so maybe it's going to be on for you. Yeah. Well, Up and we'll down see. the whole coast. Yeah, it's good everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> but, so. yeah, we'll keep you posted. All right. Well, that's good. Cool, cool. We appreciate it, Ross, man. It was good catching up. Yeah, man. All right. Always Learned a pleasure a to have you on, man. <laughs> Learned a lot. Yeah. I just talk a lot. <laughs> so, all right, oh, fellas. We'll, um, we'll just do it again another time if yeah. you want. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining, man. We appreciate it.